Let's open up in prayer. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Glory and honor to your name. Lord, we thank you this morning for mercy and your grace. We count it a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. For Christ Jesus is our cornerstone. Lord, we know there's many desire to be here this morning, but because of their condition and because of those that's not willing to go out the way to bring them here, they're not here this morning. Lord, those that desire to be here, I ask you to be with them right where they are. And Lord, we thank you right now. Lord, we thank you right now that we're here, that you, we're here in a sound mind and activity of our limbs, God. And Lord, well, let us use our mouths to praise you this morning. Our limbs to lift you up and praise you and worship you. Our hearts to be grateful for everything you've done in our life, God. Our ears to be open to hear your word. Lord, we want to leave here changed more like you. It is a privilege, Shiribu. It is a privilege to be here, God. Lord, we don't want to waste this time. We want to, don't want to be distracted. We don't want to be at idle. Lord, we, des you, we will give you praise. You deserve our praise. Lord, I ask you to look on every heart and every mind. Show them all the things that you have did for them and blessed them and prevented things to happen to them that a praise will come forth today, that you will enjoy the praise and worship this morning. It is all for you, God. And we thank you for being in our presence. And Lord, we ask you to move and do what only you can do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us give the Lord a hand clap for praise, amen. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. I just want to welcome you all here to Harvest Christian Center. We're so glad you chose Harvest as your place of worship. And I pray to you, you won't leave here the same in Jesus' name. You will leave here refreshed and renewed in your spirit. If you're a first-time guest, I want to say to you, welcome home. You may, may have come as a guest, but I pray you leave here as a friend. And if you are a guest, I want to encourage you to fill out a Connect card. And at the end of service, on your way out, there will be a Connect Center. You exchange it for a gift, a fresh-baked treat. Amen. The first, the fresh baked treat this morning, I guess bakers made jumbo Reese's Pieces peanut butter cookies. Amen. Let's give it up for our guest bakers. I was going to bring them out here, but I already confiscated them in the back. I'm taking them home to my wife. Amen. And we'll give you a voucher for a free large pizza. Let's give our guests a warm harvest welcome. Amen. We're a little uh, thin here. Our, our youth is out at youth. Uh, camp, and we got a delegation from our congregation there. But be praying for them that God will pour out His Spirit on them. They come back on fire for God. Amen. At this time, prepare your hearts to give as Pastor Jerry comes to receive today's tithes and offering. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise, for Pastor Jerry. You know, there is joy in the Lord. And this is part of the service that we have. It's joyful to be able to give God back a portion of what He has so graciously given to us. Our, our offering scripture today is 1 Chronicles 29 and 9. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. You know, our Father in heaven rejoices greatly when we give back unto him as well. Let we go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we praise you and we glorify you and we lift up our Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord, for who you are, Lord. And, Lord, as we give back a portion of what you have so graciously given to us, Lord, we just ask, Lord, to be shaken together, pressed down, and running over, to bring forth the glory and praise that you deserve. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Christ's name, amen.
sermon or read a book or I'll, I'll hear a song. And, and when I see those words, it just makes me feel like, you know what, I wish I had wrote that. Because when I see the lyrics and I sing the lyrics of this worship song, I'm thinking, that is my testimony. Has God been good to anybody else in this house today? 
Is there truly joy in the house of the Lord? Glory to God. All my life, all I, all I can testify to you this morning is all my life, God has been faithful. If it weren't for the faithfulness of God, this old boy wouldn't be standing on this platform today. I want to tell you, though, God has been good to me. And if you're older than I am, you probably already understand the faithfulness and the goodness of God. But if you're younger than I am and you're still trying to get in the way and, and walk in the way which is called straight and follow Jesus, let me just assure you of one thing. You'll never regret following Jesus. Jesus will be good to you and you'll, you'll find out that God will be faithful every step of the way. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to try to settle down and get into the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, worship band. Don't you appreciate these folks? Hallelujah. Somebody asked me this morning, where do we keep getting this talent? Where do we keep getting these folks? Uh, God sent them, okay? God sent them. We, we thank the Lord for them. So grateful for them. I want to talk to you today in a different vein from what I've been speaking to you over the last few Sundays. Of course, we're leaving behind the Truest series immediately. When I stepped into the lobby after the 11 o'clock service last Sunday, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm done with that, and, and, and get, began to give me a word to move forward. And so in obedience to the Lord today, I want to talk to you about this theme, this topic of resisting the devil. Now, I say this comically, but has Satan ever sent you a text message? <laughs> He's a little bit more subtle than that, isn't he? But we must admit the devil is on the offensive. Let me set this up by reviewing a little bit of history. Anybody here like history? What about World War history? <laughs> In 1939, just before the outbreak of World War II, Adolf Hitler devised this heinous plan. And the leaders of Germany and Russia got together and they signed a treaty that promised that neither nation would attack the other nation. And it was kind of a pact, but Hitler had this agreement going on with the leaders of Russia that here's what we'll do. We're about to do this thing and we're about to conquer the world and here's how we're going to divide up the country. So Germany and Russia had come into cahoots, it so appeared, in the signing of this treaty, this pact that says we're going to dominate the whole world. We're going to take over the rest of the known world and this is how we will divide up the countries. However, in the year 1941, Hitler and Nazi Germany went on ahead and invaded Russia and said, we want Russia too. What's going on? Well, Hitler never, ever intended to keep that treaty. It was all just a, a kind of a falsehood so that he could get them to sit still and not attack them while they were out trying to take over the rest of the world. And as soon as they got strong enough and felt like they could do it, they're going to take over Russia as well. Can I tell you that just like Hitler, the devil is a liar? Satan is on the offensive. You don't have to be the most spiritually astute, observant child of God to recognize. You don't have to have a strong sense of spiritual discernment to recognize that there is still a devil loose. Satan is on the offensive. And can I just tell you, if you're really getting this thing right and you're really following Jesus Christ, then you recognize the hand of the devil. You see that he's fighting you and that he comes against you. And the Bible even describes him as the adversary of our soul. We have an enemy, and it ain't the person seated beside you. We do not wrestle flesh and blood, but there is a devil loose, but praise be unto God, we already have the victory secured for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is the Lord of Lords, and He is the King of Kings, and this is where our victory resides. Jesus told us a lot about the devil. In the Bible, we learn that the devil is a liar, and, and we learn that the devil will tell you. Can I just help you to understand something? When the devil speaks to you, he doesn't send you a text message and just say straight out what he's going to do. No, the devil will speak to you and try to tell you anything you want to hear. Whatever he has to tell you, he will tell you so that he can get you to do what he wants you to do. And it will be so subtle that it will almost feel right. You're like you know what, this is good, this is right. This, and you don't really realize sometimes until you're like halfway into this thing or on the other side of it and you see the consequences, you're like, oh no, I've been duped again. And, and here's the 
characteristic for your life. If you're following Jesus and you've got great concern about this, let me help you to understand something. If you find that in your life you're always making choices that follow the path of the least resistance, you're probably being duped and you're following the lies of the devil. The path of least resistance will make you crooked. Okay? But if you're going to live by faith and follow Jesus Christ, there's going to be days where you're going to have to make choices that lead you to do hard things. But by faith you can do the hard things because you're following Jesus. Amen? This is what Jesus says about the devil. In John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says the devil was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Do you believe that? Say amen if you do. So then the victory that Christians have, it requires that we resist the devil. The Bible actually tells us that. Matter of fact, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. However, what I find in a lot of Christians' life is that we don't resist the devil. We kind of laugh and we, we just kind of him, give him a pat on the back and, oh, ain't this going to be fun. All the while, I mean, he's sticking knives in your back. I mean, some people... Some Christians, I know this ain't you, but some Christians in some churches in a galaxy far, far away, they even like to deny the existence of the devil. They listen to sermons like this pastor's preaching this morning. Today. Come on, preacher, that's just a little bit too much, isn't it? I mean, is there really a, a real devil? Well, listen, I've lived long enough. <laughs> I've encountered enough of his minions. I've had enough spiritual warfare in my Christian life. If you don't want to believe the Word of God, please believe the experience of this man of God. I promise you there is a real devil, and he seeks to devour and destroy you. That's his agenda. He wants to destroy you, but he can't do it on his own. No, he has to have your help. Therefore, he lies to you. And he suddenly tells you kind of half-truths and it makes you begin to d doubt the things of God to the point where you're actually in cooperation with his plan to destroy you. Make no doubt about it in your heart. The devil don't like Christians. He don't like you if you're a born-again child of God and you're trying to live a life that's wholly balanced and following the Lord Jesus Christ, he does not like you, and he is out to get you. The Bible tells us that Jesus clarifies the agenda of the devil when he told us in John 10, 10, that he comes to seek, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Is that clear to us? There's a real devil, and he's out to destroy us. So, Jesus, though, on the other hand, says, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. He doesn't want you to settle just for life that, okay, I'm, I'm existing. And a lot of us are doing that in the kingdom of God, by the way. We've been born again. We've been given new life. And we're just humming along, so hum. Off to work, and we don't resist the devil. We're just settling for a lie. Oh, I know I'm saved by the grace of God. Nobody can talk me out of my salvation. I've made this profession of faith. I've said that prayer with you, preacher. But Jesus says, I want you to have life and life more abundantly. And the abundant life is the life that walks in the victory that Jesus Christ has already secured on your behalf. Let's get into the text this morning. I'm preaching a lot, and I need to read some scripture. Amen. I mean, it just seems right. If you're going to preach, you should read some Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Please grab a hold of the Word of God today. It begins, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, 
seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. What I want to do today is to take a few moments and share with you four ways that you can efficiently, actively, practically resist the devil. I mean, resist the devil is a good sermon all itself, right? Just two-word sermon. Don't you wish it was that, that easy and we, we all understood? It? But no, we need practical steps. I mean, it's, it's good. And, and listen, if you can't get in the vein of this on Sunday and worship Jesus and have a great time in an altar service, I mean, I just wonder about you. But here's where we need real help. It's called Monday. You know, when the emotional high of worship in Jesus with the church family just kind of, so this is where we need real help on Tuesday. And on Thursday, when the boss man's giving me a rough time, knowing I've already put in all I want to put in, I've given him my best, and it still ain't enough to please nobody, that's when I need the help of the Lord. I want to show you four ways that you and I, if we will, we can resist the devil actively and practically. This does not come accidentally, my friend. We can, though, actively resist the devil. And then we will not be like some unstable militia force in a third world country that when you look at them, you're unsure if they really are ever going to have victory. No, if you and I will simply follow the word of God and obey the Lord and resist the devil, we have the victory. We resist the devil by faith because Jesus Christ has already secured our victory. We don't work for the victory. We work from the victory. Jesus already got the victory. We walk in it and, and knowing that he's already got it. I'm not trying to win a battle. Jesus has already won my battles. I go through my sufferings looking like telling folks, you know, it don't matter what it looks like. I've already won. I'm a victor. I'm walking in victory. I want to share with you these four real quick. Like we understand from the Bible, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So let's get to it. I want to just leave that one slide up for a few minutes this morning. And I want to go through these four with you. And just in case you're very young and you can't read cursive writing, <laughs> don't stray, don't strut, don't stoop, don't stop. I'll finish each one as we go. Sometimes Christians get involved in this rat race of the world and, and we act like we're just too busy to slow down and take the time to actually interact with God's word and that gets us in trouble because if you're not interacting with God's word you're going to get in trouble very quickly because it won't be very long before you'll lose fellowship with not just the written word but the living word of God Jesus Christ himself and you'll find yourself ashamed when you get into the presence of God and it's time to really get out some big prayers and really intercede for somebody you'll feel ashamed like I don't even belong in the presence of God and it's because you feel like a stranger because you've been ignoring his word and his presence all through the week and then conviction rests on your soul. God help us. We got time to do everything else in the world we want to do. Why can't we take 15 to 30 minutes a day to just open up this book and read it? I know everybody don't need to Bible, be a Bible scholar and everybody don't have to understand the original languages and, and do word studies like I do. You don't have to be a nerd like I am, but you need the word. Okay? You need the word of God for yourself. And I've told you this many times, but I'll tell you again because I think it bears repeating. If the only time you ever hear scripture is on Sunday, then friend, you got a problem. It's an anemic Christian life. There's suffering and there's a lack of victory. And you're wandering. Why are you wandering? You're wandering because you're straying from the word. So I tell you today, if you want to actively, practically resist the devil, don't stray from the word. Don't stray. Listen, I'm not trying to condemn you, okay? I, I'm not trying to come down hard on you. But how about today you make up your mind once and for all, I'm going to proactively take some active steps that helps me build a plan into my life for I'm getting into the word of God. Again, listen, this is one of the simplest things you can ever do in your Christian life. It's foundational to help you walk in the victory of the truth of Jesus Christ. The victory is there and you can have it. I read through the Bible and I found many, many verses that encourage us in this vein, but I'll just share a few with a few of them with you the patriarch job he was able to say i have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food did you get that what he actually said was god's word i need that more than i need actual food that's on the table 
I, I, Lisa and I joined this club. It's an unofficial club, but you're welcome to join it with us if you want to. Many years ago, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, maybe 15, I don't know. But it's called the BBB Club, and that stands for Bible Before Breakfast. So what that means for her and I is that every morning, the first thing we're reaching for is a word from God. How are you getting a word from God so easy? I open up the Bible. <laughs> oh, but preacher, I need to hear a word. Well, sometimes if I need to hear a word from God, I'll just read the Bible out loud. Yeah, it's that simple. It's that easy. We have esteemed the words of his mouth more than our necessary food. That's what the patriarch Job said. But then the prophet Jeremiah, he said this. He said, your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. He, Job said, you know what? It's better for me than food. And then Jeremiah says, you know what I did when I found it? I ate it. Now, I'm not advocating that you begin to rip pages out. Am I? No. <laughs> but what I am advocating is that you put it into your heart so that you can meditate on it. And sometimes that's difficult. Anybody here have a short-term memory issue? Anybody have difficulty remembering at noon what you read at like 6 a.m.? <laughs> can I encourage you to just begin to write down something? Preacher, I don't have no index cards. Uh, preacher, I don't know how to write it down. Yes, you do. Most of you are carrying around a smartphone. I mean, y'all know how to copy and paste. All right, so use a Bible app, copy and paste, text message yourself, or put it into one of those little notes and, and make sure that you look at it again at lunch. And, and what you're doing by continuing to meditate upon it, you're eating the Word of God. You're letting it be the necessary nourishment for your body. Jesus says it like this. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How many of you ever forget to eat? Y'all took one look at me and said, no, it ain't him. <laughs> Anybody else look down and say, nope, it's not me. <laughs> Listen, I don't ever forget to eat. There's something in me that just kind of, you know, if I go like a half an hour past a normal mealtime, my stomach's like, hey, what's up? <laughs> the top part of my intestines saying, woohoo, you know, <laughs> drop us a little something down here. You know, I never forget to eat. Sometimes we are negligent with forgetting to feed our souls the Word of God. So I just simply want to tell you today, if you really want to resist the devil, if you're serious about you want to put an end to so much of this demonic spiritual warfare that you're having to deal with on a regular basis, don't stray from the Word. Get a Bible reading plan whereby you're hiding the Word of God in your heart. Many of you could overcome a lot of the simple sin that you're dealing with on a daily basis, those temptations, if you'd simply begin to hide the Word of God in your heart, meditate upon it. What happens when you stray from the Word of God for a prolonged period you do become spiritually anemic, you're weak, and the devil, the enemy, this, this adversary who's prowling around like a roaring lion, he's not really a roaring lion, but he's like a roaring lion, and he's roaring and he's making this noise, and, and by you straying from the word, what you've actually done is given him permission. You're, you're like looking like scared prey. And what does the wild animal do when he sees scared prey? He attacks that wild. He, that wild instinct in him wants him to go and attack that prey that's acting like it's scared. Listen, you get the word of God hidden in your heart. You begin to recognize the devices of the enemy. You'll recognize when the enemy's attacking you, and you'll begin to rebuke the devil before he even has a chance. You see, the reality is, if you understand the victory that Jesus Christ has already secured for you, the devil is like a roaring lion. It's almost as though he's toothless. All he can do is roar and make a lot of noise. But Jesus done pulled his teeth. He can't really sink into you. But all the while, you're scared and you're shaking. Because you sense there's an enemy, there's an adversary. And as long as you're walking in a spirit of fear, he don't have to do much more. Your victory is gone. Let's move forward. Not only should we not stray from the Word of God, let me just tell you, don't stray, don't strut. Y'all know what it means to strut. I would strut for y'all, but y'all just laugh. But when I was a young man... Us boys in the 11th and 12th grade, if we thought we were something that was really filling ourselves on a particular day, you could tell it. All you had to do was look down the hallway, and you could see them young men. Man, could they strut. I just wish I'd ask one of y'all to demonstrate for me. But you know, they could strut, and man, that, that gate was something else with that strut. 
And I know you want to, Pastor, where you're going with this? Well, can I just tell you, sometimes Christians get overwhelmed when they realize that God has gifted them. And I want to tell you, as a, as a gifted man of God, in the kingdom of God, who's on assignment, I've got a purpose for my life. Listen, I want to tell you, it's wonderful to know that you're appointed and anointed by the Most High. I don't say that boastful. I just say, yeah, it's wonderful. I enjoy it. But can I tell you, that also means there's a big old target on my back. And the enemy's always looking for a way to take me. You'd be surprised at the stupid stuff the enemy tries to do to distract me week by week by week. You'd be surprised and shocked. It's great to be appointed and anointed by God, but it does come with a cost and it comes with a price. But guess what we cannot do? We can never act boastful about the gifts that God has given us. Every child of God has been gifted. You've got gifts. There's things in your heart and in your life that you've got a passion to do. There are spiritual gifts. There are talents within your skill set of the way God has made you. And listen, you do have a gift, but you didn't give it to yourself. So why would you boast about it? Oh, I know y'all don't know nothing about this. Y'all probably don't pay attention, but listen, I've, I've traveled a little bit, and I understand a little bit about the body of Christ at large. Do you know that some preachers think they're so high and mighty? Some evangelists, I mean, they, they've started putting different weird things on their, their calling cards. You know, they actually go by apostle. They actually go by prophet, and, and, and they walk in and out of some of these meetings, and they've got a posse with them. I don't know what that means. They've got a group of little hireling preachers with them who are wannabes, and, and they're attracted to that person's gift, and that person walks in, and they're strutting like they are all the stuff. I mean, they've got their security detail, and they got their armor bearers is what they call them, and, and people are handing them stuff. And, and some of these evangelists, they go into some of these meetings, and they require a certain type of sparkling water. One of the first things I do before I ever invite a guest into our congregation to minister to you, I ask them the requirements up front. Before I settle any kind of date, I want to know if they're going to give me some goofy list of stuff. You know, you got to have this certain car rented for me. you, you got to have this type of sparkling water. And 15 minutes before the service, i got to have this special snack. Listen, if they start giving me any of that kind of stuff, guess what I don't need? Them. And I, hey, I'll stand in the pulpit and preach one more time. I mean, I, I wanted to bring them in because I felt like they were a gifted voice that my people needed to hear and needed to benefit from. But if they're all proud and strutting about their gifts, guess what? We can move on. Listen, let me tell you why we shouldn't strut about our gifts. We didn't give, our, give them to ourselves. Now, I can take my gift and I can work with my gift. I can hone my skill set that God has given me. I can get better at the things that God has called me to do. But at the end of the day, I still have to give the glory to God. Because if He don't want me doing it, I shouldn't be doing it. And if I get real proud and haughty about it, guess what God's going to do? He's going to watch me fall on my face. Listen to what the Bible says here in this passage of Scripture. It tells me, God resist the proud. That means that pride in the life of a gifted child of God, what pride is, is a repellent. Pride is like a repellent to the presence of God. And the more that pride is oozing from your life, God says, I ain't coming anywhere close to that. I've seen this happen in the lives of gifted servants of God. So gifted that they can actually fake it for a few weeks. And, and they're going on about this thing. And because they're so gifted, everybody's just listening and sitting in awe. But then you'll see that person fall because something about pride makes them feel like they're above the standard of righteousness that God places on all His children. Listen to what the Bible says here. It says this. It says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I want grace. I want the grace of God. Therefore, if I want grace, i got to act humble. i got to walk in humility. I can't be proud about what I do for God. None of us can be pride, prideful about what we do for God because God gave us the gift and God gives us the strength to exercise the gift. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. So let, let me just go ahead and help you out. You ever see a preacher, you ever see a worship pastor, you ever see a staff member, you ever see just a, a, a staff worker in a church, even if they're volunteer, and they seem to be really full of themselves and prideful about what they do and how they do and ain't nobody better than them and they're barking out orders all the time, telling people what to do and being mean and haughty about stuff. 
you ain't got to deal with that. Just step back and watch. Because eventually, God will let them fall. See, here's the thing I've realized. Either we keep ourselves humble or God will just sit back and watch us get humbled by life. And life will humble you. I've seen it happen to too many people in Christian leadership circles. They really thought they were all that. But eventually, nobody wants to work with them. And none of us can do what we're called to do all by ourselves in the kingdom of God. And if nobody wants to work with you and everybody begins to put distance between you and them, guess what? You got the issue. Yeah, you're about to fall. The Bible say, here says humility comes before honor. We should honor the gifted people in the kingdom of God who walk around in humility. Almost as they, they don't know that they're gifted. They don't know that God is using them in a great way. We honor those individuals. Jesus taught us, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The solution is quite clear. If you feel like you're, you're walking around in too much pride, you're, you're not walking around in enough humility, let me just tell you, here's the solution. Give God the glory for every good thing that you ever do in your life. Any good thing that comes out of you, comes out of your mouth, comes out of your life and service to God, just give God the glory. I promise you, you don't really have that many good ideas. Most of my ideas come from God. If it weren't for God, I mean, I'd just be brain dead. I'd be a walking imbecile. But God gives me some ideas, and I have to give God the glory at the end of every day, no matter what happened, how great I thought it was or how little I think it is. Listen, I got to give God the glory. I humble myself in the presence of God. Why should we do that, Pastor? Because Jesus wants to anoint every one of us so that we can help other Christians walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. So if you really want to actively resist the devil, you practically want to walk in the victory that Jesus Christ has died for you to have, guess what you need to do? Don't stray from the Word and don't strut about your gifts. And then occasionally, Christians will begin to adopt, take on for themselves, Worldly attitudes. I'll try to be careful with this, but I might hurt your feelings. Is that okay? Some of you can handle it. The rest of us, maybe we can pray through and repent at the end of church, right? You can recognize these attitudes because they smell bad. And I don't mean in the natural, but have you ever been around somebody with such a worldly, such a bad attitude that it just... It stunk and you didn't want to be around them too much. You started trying to figure out, how can I get away from this person? How can I get out of this situation? There's some stinking thinking going on in that brother or that sister in Christ. And i got to get away from them before I catch that. It's contagious. You don't want to catch it. These worldly attitudes, what they do is they lead us to unethical decisions. They, they lead us into relaxed morals, and then eventually they will take us down to a path of willful sin, and we'll explain it away. We'll act as though we are justified. And when you live with a worldly attitude, this worldliness, let me just explain to you, you're participating in a system that opposes the abundant, victorious life that Jesus Christ wants you to have. So I tell you, don't stray from the Word. Don't strut about your gifts. And don't stoop to worldliness. A balanced lifestyle of holiness is what really helps you maintain the victory in Jesus Christ. That balance, though, it upsets the enemy. What the enemy would rather do is help you to question various things about God's Word. And the enemy wants to get you to this point and to this path where you're questioning stuff and, and, and you're going to an extreme. Satan loves it when children of God go to one extreme or the other. And I've seen it happen in the body of Christ. And I've seen it happen in church leaders where they're, they're preach on, they're harp on one specific thing. And they get in excess instead of leading that balanced life that stays in the middle of the road, in the middle of the Word, and follows Jesus Christ in His holiness. The devil don't like it when we stay balanced. He wants to get us, get us off in excess in one ditch or the other ditch. Because if we're in excess, we're hurting the body of Christ. We're dividing people instead of trying to help people follow Jesus, passage of scripture that you can look at on your own, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Worldliness is a condition of the inner person that eventually will manifest itself in the outer person. It eventually gets revealed. What I'm actually talking about is, is another word, it's consecration. Consecration to Christ is the biblical call for every believer in Christ Jesus. If you call yourself a Christian, my friend, you have been called to consecrate your life, to surrender it all, every doubt, everything that you are, on a daily basis to follow Jesus Christ. So I tell you, don't stray from the Word. Don't strut about your gifts. Don't stoop to worldliness, number four. Don't 
stop believing. Now, I know some of you are going back to the song. You're going to begin to hum a song in your mind. Don't stop believing. Okay. If that works for you and helps you to remember, don't stop believing. I know a lot of Christians have made a great start. Many of you in this house today, you've made a great start in your faith and following the Lord Jesus Christ. But I need you to realize something. The race of faith is a journey of a lifetime. Okay, it's, it's not like a three-week sprint. It's a marathon that you'll be running for the rest of your Christian life. You'll never get to a point on this side of heaven where you have spiritually arrived and you're better than everyone else. And you don't have to exercise faith. No. May I su just suggest to you that if your Christian life, if your version of Christianity has gotten you so comfortable that it doesn't take any faith to live it, you're no longer following Jesus. You're following yourself. You're beginning to follow the path of least resistance. But I'm going to tell you, the life that Jesus calls you to live on a daily basis is going to call you to a place of faith. We're going to have to believe God for big things despite what you see. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. The call of God upon your life is to continuously believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, as your King. So here's the reality we must come back to. The kingdom of God is not of this world. We resist the devil by faith because Jesus Christ has already secured our victory. King Jesus has disarmed all the principalities and powers through his cross and his subsequent resurrection. He, he's actually already pulled the sting out of death. The, the devil knows he can't win, so what he's doing is going around like a roaring lion, and he's making a lot of noise, and he's, and he's trying to hinder and harass the children of God. But you and I can stand victorious in the shadow of our King, knowing that I've already got the victory. Jesus has already secured it. And today I've just shared with you four simple ways that you can proactively, practically resist the devil. Some of you in your individual Christian walk and for your household, for your family's sake. You need to take a stand today and give the devil a black eye. I read this powerful true story that I need to share with you. Two friends are visiting France, and they're visiting a real famous museum. And as they're going through looking at the paintings, these two friends, they come across a very famous painting that's titled it's actually called Checkmate. And it's a very poignant painting because as the two friends are standing there, they're mesmerized for a few moments. And the picture, it's actually got a picture of a young man hunkered over a chessboard. But on the other side is Satan, the devil himself. And the devil is sitting there full of pride and is grinning from ear to ear. And the name of the painting is Checkmate. This is what the devil has just told the person on the other side of the chair. Chessboard. Checkmate. If you're familiar with chess, that means <laughs> game over. I win. But these two individuals are standing there and they're watching and they're looking at this, and looking at the details because the chess pieces are in focus on this chessboard. And one of these two individuals, these two friends, is actually an international chess champion. He's a master of this game. He wants to stand there a little bit longer, and he continues to study the picture. And he tells his friend, you go on, I'll catch up with you in a few minutes. But after about 30 more seconds of standing there by himself, of gazing at the chessboard, he steps back for a moment, and he's in awe. And he, he says, it's wrong. And he runs, and he gets his friend, and, and he brings him back. He says, look, it's wrong. we got to contact the painter. This is not checkmate. The king has one more move. Oh, child of God, you need to hear your pastor this morning. Regardless of what the enemy has told you, he might have yelled checkmate over your life. You may feel like the devil's done told you, game over. There's no chance for you having victory. It may be about your health. It may be about your children. It may be about your marriage. But I want to tell you, King Jesus always has one more move. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Stand with me all over this house. Prayer team, come on down quickly. Friend, I don't know if the devil's been lying to you or not. I don't know what you might have heard, what you might have been thinking lately, but don't you dare give up. The king has one more move.
The devil might have been lying to you. He might have been telling you it's all over. You'll never make it in the Christian life. You're not going to make it to heaven. You're not a good Christian. I don't care how he's been lying to you. You need to let him know, devil, you forgot Jesus answers for me. And King Jesus has got one more move. If the devil's been lying to you, don't you wait for us to sing another lyric. You better get on down here. You better get to praying and rebuking the devil. Let's begin to resist the devil today in Jesus' name. Come on, let's pray. Hallelujah. Sure. 
the Holy Spirit was actually talking to some individuals, several of you today, not just in general throughout the message, but on a specific couple of things. And I, and I want to tell you, friend, I don't mean to condemn anybody. If, if you're just not taking the time to interact with God's Word, I want to bless you today. I, I want to be a part of the solution. If you'll talk to me or Pastor John, remember the staff, we'll actually get some actual like hard copy Bible reading plans in your hands. Okay, we'll tell you a system. We'll share what works for us, and maybe it'll work for you. But whatever you do, get a plan. Get into the practice of interacting with God's Word on a daily basis. You'll never regret that, I promise you. Secondly, second action, Adam, I need to tell some of you, stop tolerating the devil. Stop playing patty cake with him when you recognize that He's actually involved in, in coming against your family and, and telling lies. I'm not telling you to act like you're schizophrenic or nothing in front of your family, but you can go into a prayer closet and you can begin to rebuke the power and the presence of the devil and you walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. Let that be the aurora, the environment that you bring into every place, into every meeting, into every room. Let your family know, listen, they may not. They may not want to cooperate with the blessing and the victory of Jesus Christ, but you can. And you can change the environments that you're going into if you'll rebuke the enemy ahead of time and walk in there in the victory of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen if you believe it. Hallelujah. I pray that. Well, come on. If you're going to give praise to God, give praise. Don't play patty cake. You're, you're not applauding for me. I've simply tried to obey the Lord today. And in these final moments, I've realized that I'm the one that gets the privilege to dismiss today's service. So let me just explain a couple of more announcements to you. Next Saturday morning, that's June the 18th, there's going to be a men's breakfast fellowship. You're welcome to join with our Micah men, any man, 18. or I mean, did we have an age on that? No age on that breakfast. So, yeah, all men, you're invited next Saturday morning, 8 a.m. at the Denny's or up here on Nine Mile to join our men for breakfast. You'll enjoy that time of fellowship with the Micah men. As well, this coming Tuesday morning is our nursing home ministry. If you'd like to be a part of that, you are welcome to. I want to tell you, it just delights the residents at specialty care when our ministry group is there and just singing to them and loving on them, being kind to them. And maybe you've never thought about doing that, but if you've got availability, let me encourage you to because one day it may be me or you there that would appreciate somebody coming by and showing us a little bit of love in Jesus' name. Amen? Next Sunday is Father's Day Sunday, and we want to encourage you to be here and bring the men that you listen. Even if there's men in your life you don't love, you still need to bring them next Sunday, okay? 
And every man that's here, 18 and older, will receive a free gift. There's going to be also a special photo op that we're working towards next Sunday for pictures with the men in your life. How many of you are glad you've been in the house of God today? Praise God. I want to go just a little bit further in Scripture for your dismissal, the blessing that I want to leave you with. If you would just kind of lift up your head towards the heavens and with palms raised up. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.